There we go. So um, just a quick reminder on our identities that we're using here. So we have our reciprocal identities. So turning everything into sine and cosine, right? That was like our main plan of attack. And then if stuff is squared, we can start thinking about our Pythagorean identity, which our main one is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. We also have the modifications of that. First of all, cosine squared equals one minus sine squared and also sine squared equals one minus cosine squared. So we're gonna be using these ones a lot today, I think. And obviously we'll be using these ones a lot and we'll use our uh, even odd identities a little bit. Um, I actually think just on the first problem here, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do number eight then. Um, so we, so um, I would say our first plan of attack, changing everything to sine and cosine is what I would do first. So we can call this sine of negative x. I'm gonna go ahead and put that over one, over one over sine of negative x. Plus cosine of x over one, over one over cosine of x. Now, I think I told you on number seven that if you have adding or subtracting in a numerator or denominator, I always like to do that first with a common denominator. But this one is kind of like a fraction on top of a fraction separate from a different fraction on top of a fraction. So I'm going to kind of deal with these two separately, okay? First of all, on both of these, I have a negative inside of a sign. So we learned on Friday that if you have a negative inside of a sign, you can change that to a positive so long as you move that negative out to the front. So I'm going to do that in both cases. Remember, cosine was kind of the magical one for those where the negative just goes away and it stays positive. But sine and tan, it moves to the front. So then I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal here. So times negative sine x over 1. And do the same thing here, actually. So times cosine x over one. So for this one, it's negative sine times negative sine. Now we actually know that a negative times a negative is always a positive. And so this one's gonna be sine squared of x, a positive sine squared x. So sine times sine is sine squared. And then this one will just be cosine times cosine, which will of course be cosine squared x. And here we have our favorite Pythagorean identity um, sine squared plus cosine squared of uh, the same thing. And so we know that always turns into one. Did anybody over the weekend tell their significant other that they were their sine squared plus cosine squared and only? I, I guess that's, per I don't want to ask, it's personal, okay? All right, good job, Alex. A quick note here, okay, um, that we might have been a little worried about this being like a negative here. So uh, a negative sine times a negative sine did turn out to be a positive sine squared, right? But what if it was negative sine squared plus cosine squared? What is that? It's actually nothing, okay? So we know sine squared plus cosine squared is one, right? But if you have one of those two is negative and the other one's positive, you really can't turn that into anything. If it was negative sine squared plus cosine squared, that's not one, that's not negative one either. It's kind of nothing. Now. If they're both negative, if you have negative sine squared minus cosine squared, that actually is negative one um, because it's like you're taking this one and multiplying it by negative one. And so the, the one turns into negative one as well. But if you have one of each, don't try to do anything fancy with that because that's nothing, okay? All right, we're gonna go ahead and again, skip number nine and head off to number 10. Skipping number nine because it doesn't exist. All right, so number 10, um, looks like we have a lot of stuff there that we can change into sines and cosines, right? So I'm definitely gonna start off with that. So we have one over one plus cosine A over sine A. And then that's over one over sine A. Um, we've been doing a lot of tangents. So we know tangent is sine over cosine, right? So just remember cotangent is the reciprocal of that. So it's just gonna be upside down. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and since I have adding in a numerator of like a big complex fraction, I'm going to do that addition with common denominator. So I'm going to multiply this one by sine A over sine A. And so this will be sine A over, actually, 
I'm, I'm doing a common denominator, so I can go ahead and add the numerators here. So sine A plus cosine A, taking both of these numerators into account here, all over the common denominator of sine A, which is over one over sine A. So once you get a common denominator, you just add the numerators together, keep that common denominator the same, that kind of combines, right? Okay, now I'm ready to multiply by the reciprocal here. So I'll go ahead and do that. Times sine A over one. So we can definitely cross cancel those side A's. So that makes it a lot simpler. So then I have sine A plus cosine A. Is there anything I can do to that? Can I simplify that any further? The answer is actually no. This is actually done right here. So that's gonna be our final answer, okay? Why are we not allowed to turn that into one? Well, remember, Pythagorean identity only works if these things are squared, okay? Sine A, and I think I specifically mentioned this on Friday, sine A plus cosine A does not equal one. All right, it's just sine A plus cosine A, nothing you can do with it. Is sine A plus cosine A still simpler than what I started with on this problem? I'm gonna say definitely yes, like one plus cotan A over cosecant A. That's definitely more complicated than my final answer, right? So if our goal is to simplify, I'd say we did it, all right? All right, next up, number 11. Number 11 is a really tough one here, especially at the end. Actually, the first few steps are, are not too tough, but at the end, it gets tough. So um, watch along with me. So like I said, first steps should be uh, kind of familiar to you. It's going to be just changing everything into sines and cosines. You'll notice again, and, and I, I've, I've done this a few times now, is even the ones that I'm not changing into sine and cosine, for example, the cosine x on top, I am kind of changing it into a fraction. I think when you have a lot of fractions, it's best to just turn everything to a fraction. So if it's, you know, if it's just cosine or sine, put it over one. Or we saw number 10 when it was one, I put one over one as well, just to kind of help visualize everything. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the addition on bottom. The good news on bottom is that I already have a common denominator, right? Um, ya tengo un denominator común abajo. And so I can just add the numerators together and then keep that denominator as cosine x. My numerator will be cosine x over one. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply by the reciprocal now. All right, in the numerator, I have cosine x times cosine x. So that makes cosine squared x. And on the bottom, I have one plus sine x, okay? So if you were kind of working on this one on your own and you got this far, I would say you did a really good job. I would say that you kind of did everything that we had learned how to do up to this point. And that's great, but we're not done, okay? This to me is not simple enough. This is still pretty complex. So where do we go from here, okay? Well, some, a technique that we're actually gonna use a couple times today is I'm never gonna be able to cancel out the cosine squared with a sign on bottom, right? But why don't I change cosine squared into one minus sine squared and see what happens, okay? I just wanna take a look at that. Maybe it won't help me, but maybe it will. So I'm gonna use that identity. So we're gonna change cosine squared X into one minus sine squared X. Now, obviously I cannot cancel down one minus sine squared with one plus sine, right? They are not the same, they are different. I cannot cancel one of these signs down with one of the signs on bottom because it's adding and subtracting with something else. But let me tell you what I can do, okay? There's actually two things I can do with one minus sine squared x. The first thing is I can change it back to cosine squared. I don't want to do that because that's like where I came from, right? That's like untying the shoe I just tied. But what could I do? I can actually factor, 
okay? Factor. Well, how can I factor one minus sine squared? I can factor it as the difference of perfect squares. So I can make this into one minus sine x times one plus sine x. It's like when we factor uh, what? Like x squared minus nine, right? x plus three, x minus three. One is a perfect square. Sine squared is a perfect square. So it'd be one minus sine, one plus sine. Why would I want to do that? Because then I can cancel out one plus sine. And I'm left with my final answer, which is one minus sine x, OK? So definitely difficult, that last couple steps there, OK? Are we going to have a few problems on our web assignment for this that are that difficult? Yes. Are we going to have a ton that are that difficult? No. Most of them are going to be like the easier ones. We'll have a few of the harder ones, OK? So try your best. The harder ones are the ones you should be asking questions on. And uh, we'll get up to that 90%, OK, and get our 10 out of 10. OK, now we're going to move into a different type of problem that's called prove trigonometric identities. So these are called proofs. Now, when I say proofs, a lot of people get triggered here because they think of geometry and those two column proofs that they made you do there. That is like torture to freshmen and sophomores. I got good news for you. That's not this, OK? This is different. Um, you do not need to write any words other than sine, cosine, or, or tangent, or whatever, OK? Um, all it is is, and, and a lot of people actually like these more, because as we were doing these ones, especially that last one, you might have been thinking, like, how do I know when to stop, right? How do I know when I'm done? Well, the good thing about these proofs is I actually tell you where to stop. So I'm saying, work on this. And once you get it to look like sine squared, you're done. So it's like, I'm, it's not like. It is. I'm giving you the answer. So. Like, how do we grade that, right? Well, your, your, your answer is actually your work. You showing me how to get from here to there, OK? So all you have to do is just show your work, and you will prove it. Now, how do they do this on WebAssign? Well, actually, they, like, um, they, they do the proof, but they just leave a bunch of blanks in there. And you just have to fill out the blanks as if you were doing the work, OK? So I'll, I'll kind of show you it once we're done with that problem. So, but let's give some advice here. I definitely agree with this one. Start with the more complicated side. It's always easier to make something in, in math that's complicated to make it simple. It's easier to do that than to make something that's simple turn it complicated. Okay. And then um, it says here convert to sines and cosines. We already kind of know that, right? So I still agree with that. And don't perform operations on both sides of the equation. So don't think of this like solving equation where I have to like add sign here and add sign there. We're not doing the same thing to both sides. We're really just working on one side, okay? And which side are we working on? The more complicated side, okay? All right. So let's start off then with number 12. So number 12, we're going to ask ourselves what side is more complicated? I would definitely say that the left side is more complicated. Would you guys agree with that? It's got more trig functions. It's got something we can turn into sines and cosines. So look for that as well. Can I turn something into sines and cosines? So I'm just going to work on the left-hand side. I'm going to work on it until it says sine squared, and then I'll be done. So what can I do to the left side? Well, I can change everything to sines and cosines. That's a good place to start, right? So again, I'm just going to work on the left side here. Two options for what to do next. We could do common denominator subtraction inside the parentheses. That would certainly work. What I think is a little bit easier is distributing the cosine in here. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the cosine in there. Now, cosine times one over cosine. Actually, when you multiply that, the cosines just cancel out. So it's one. You guys with me on that? Cosine times one over cosine. I mean, if, or if you want to think about it, it, or yeah, they cross cancel, right? Or it could be cosine over cosine, which is one. Cosine times negative cosine is negative cosine squared. Well, what is one minus cosine squared? According to our Pythagorean identity, our modification right here, one minus cosine squared is sine squared, right? So I can write this as sine squared theta. And what is sine squared theta? That's what I was trying to get to. So I'm done. Okay. So when you're doing this on WebAssign, 
they would probably leave like um they would probably leave this they'd have all this written and they'd have like a blank right here and you just have to type in the blank you have to type in cosine theta and then they might leave like this one blank too and you'd have to type in there cosine squared theta so they just they do the work that you should be doing probably and they just leave some of the, the things blank and you just type in what it should be okay all right next up we'll do number 13. So number 13, which side looks more complicated? I actually think that the right side looks more complicated, even though everything is already in terms of sine and cosine. We do have two big fractions there that are subtracting. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that subtraction. So I'm just gonna work on the right-hand side and make it look like the left-hand side. So I'm gonna have in the back of my mind, I'm trying to make it look like two tan secant. Okay, so we're gonna do common denominator over here. So this one's gotta multiply by one minus sine x. This one's got to multiply by one plus sine x. And so then we'll have this all over our common denominator of one minus sine x times one plus sine x. In the numerator, I have to distribute the one. So it would be one plus sine x on the left. On the right, we actually have to distribute a negative one. So remember, anytime it's subtracting, you're going to distribute that negative into the numerator. This will be minus one plus sine x, okay? It's plus sine x because I distribute a negative one into a negative sign so that makes a positive sine x. All right, next up, I'm going to combine like terms. So we have a, a positive one and a negative one, so they're going to cancel out. And then I have sine x plus sine x. Now, sine x times sine x is sine squared, but sine x plus sine x is two sine x. Two sine, also my favorite Arizona city, two sine. I get it like Tucson. I've actually never been to Tucson, so I, I, I don't think I've ever been to Arizona. So. Um, all right. On bottom, what can I do on bottom? I kind of don't like it written like that. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply these two together, okay? So normally we'd have to foil these, but these are actually conjugates. Do you guys remember we used to talk conjugates and I said instead of foiling conjugates, you can actually like and we did this a lot when we did imaginary numbers like five plus two i and five minus two i. I said don't foil, just do a because those are conjugates, right? Well, these are actually conjugates as well. Conjugate just means it's the same thing in both parentheses, but one's adding and one's subtracting. And so conjugates you can that would be one times one is one minus sine squared of x. Well, one minus sine squared of x, what can I turn that into? Well, I could factor it, but that would just be going back into the, you know, what I just came from, the one minus sine, one plus sine. But remember, I can also turn it into one minus sine squared can turn into cosine squared. So I'm going to go ahead and do that next. And now I'm kind of thinking back to that left side, 2 tan x times secant x. And I'm remembering that's my goal, right? Is to turn this into 2 tan x times secant x. So can I take what I have written here in green? And can I turn that into 2 tan x? Secant x. I think I actually can. Okay, let me show you what I'm going to do here. I am going to write this as I'm going to kind of split it up here into several fractions. So I'm going to write it as two over one. What's two over one? Well, that's really two, correct? Then I'm going to write that at the next piece as sine x over cosine x. 
Do I have a sine X on top that I could put there? Yes. Do I have a cosine X on bottom that I could put there? Yes, I do. And I'm going to write the last one as what's left over. Well, there's nothing left over up top, so I'm going to put a one. There's another cosine X left on bottom, so I'm going to put cosine X. And look what we have there. Two over one times sine X over cosine X times one over cosine X. What is that? Well, I would say that that is two times tan X times secant X, which is exactly what we were looking for. Mind blown. Okay, one more, number 14. As I look at number 14, which side's more complicated? It seems clear to me that the right side is more complicated. We have some stuff we can turn into sine and cosine. We have something that's squared, so I like that. The left side, I don't really know what I could do with that. So I'm gonna work on the, the right side now. How do we make it look like the left-hand side? So we're gonna turn this into sine squared theta over cosine squared theta over one over cosine minus one over one. All right, I'm gonna do a little common denominator subtraction on bottom. Let's multiply this one by cosine over cosine. I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the reciprocal now. Can we cross cancel anything? I can actually, I can cross cancel the cosine theta with one of the cosines out of the cosine squared. So I'm left with sine squared theta. over cosine theta times one minus cosine theta. So I feel like I'm a little bit stuck here, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at where I'm trying to get to, right? Remember, look at our goal. We're trying to get to this left-hand side is one plus cosine theta over cosine theta. like. Trig proofs are kind of like life, man. All right, I'm gonna get philosophical here. Don't just think about like what you have now, think about what you want, right? Think about where you're going. All right, boom, life advice from Mr. Barry. So what do I got going on here? Well, I want a cosine theta on bottom and look, I have it. So this is actually a kind of a good sign to me here. I wanna get rid of this one minus cosine. And also this sine squared really doesn't fit up here, correct? So. We're gonna use a move that I feel like we've kind of been using, we've used twice, I think already in, in different forms. I'm gonna change that sine squared on top. I'm gonna to change it into one minus cosine squared. The, the sign doesn't really fit there anyway. Like the, it doesn't match with everything else. So since it's squared, remember we can always switch it to, uh, to one minus cosine squared. And then what are we going to do with the one minus cosine squared on top now? My second favorite F word, factor. So we'll call it one minus cosine theta times one plus cosine theta. And that sets up really nicely because the one minus cosine theta, we can cancel out and we are left with 
one plus cosine theta over cosine theta. And what do you think that is? What we were trying to get to on the other side. Boom, did it. Awesome. 